Okay, welcome everyone. So, uh, I'm not familiar with some of these names, uh, and I'm looking at uh, Joey... Lahulier. Lahulier. Okay, got it. So, um, you're first up, if you'd like to take a seat and introduce yourself to the committee, or I, have you been here before? Okay, so we'll introduce ourselves first. Thanks. Uh, I'm Chip Troiano. I represent Hardware Standard in Walden. Uh, Matt Byron, representing Regens, Harrisburg, Waltham, Pan, and Madison. Riddle Zott from Barnard. Lisa Hango from Berkshire. No voice. Oh, we can skip dear. you if you like. We can introduce you if you like. <laughs> I got a last year. I've got a bunch of yeah. Tommy Waltz from Barry City. Mary Howard from Rutland City. Okay. And you were the owner of Foot Book Farm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so my name is Joey LaVoyer. Uh, for Brook Farm, we are an organic vegetable farm in Johnson, Memorial County. Um, we grow about 145 different varieties of vegetables and fruits. We are probably at the, the eighth largest um, organic farm in the state out of 36 farms. I'm here today because I am very concerned about the minimum wage. Um, and how much it is increasing every year um, with the understanding that if it passes, it could be $15 an hour. Um, I'm not sure about the year, maybe 2022, or I'm not 24. sure. 24. 24, okay. Um, that being said, the minimum wage has been going up a little bit every year, or for us, it feels like a lot. Um, our farm is um, enrolled in the H-2A program, uh, which is a federal program um, and the reason for that, and that is we, we have workers that come from Jamaica every year. Um, we entered into that program four years ago uh, for a number of reasons, but mostly because uh, we just, we don't have the people, the employees that want to come and work on a farm anymore. Um, so we were really struggling with finding help, um, but we were really struggling to get uh, good help or experienced help. One year, it was 2013, we went through uh, 50 employees through our farm. Um, we only need about 14 to 17. Uh, that being said, we, we do not have that number coming, knocking on our door anymore. Um, so having the H-2A program and having those workers come um, is really vital to our business. Um, but because we're in the H-2A pro program, our minimum wage is set. Um, and that minimum wage is based off of what the minimum wage is in Vermont. So each state um, has a different H-2A minimum wage. Uh, this year, our minimum wage is $13.25. Um, we do have management staff and people that have been with us for a number of years, so those folks are obviously a lot higher than that. Um, in the last few years, we've been really struggling financially. Um, and the way that we've been dealing with that is is just decreasing the number of employees that um, we have coming into the farm. And that is obviously causing a giant stress on myself, but, but mainly my husband, who is the farmer and who is just every year saying, I'm just going to keep doing more. Um, and he's at the point now where he can't really do anymore. And I'm worried about his health and his well-being. Um, I'm also worried about our business, and we just I, I have a lot of administrative experience, so I do a profit and loss plan every year for our farm and a, and a budget, and I look at every single number and everything coming in and look to see where we can cut and what we can do to stay in business, and this year, I just, trying to go through those numbers and make them work was really, really hard, and I feel very strongly that if we get to $15 an hour, no matter how many years it takes, um, we are, we're not going to make it. We, we can't raise the price of our vegetables and fruits to a point where people will still buy them. Um, so that is my reality. Um, and I do understand that Vermont, our citizens in Vermont all have different realities. Um, but I'm hoping that there's going to be some solution, um, whether it be different minimum wage rates for different people, I'm not sure. But I hope, I hope that we can to some solution because I have reached out to other farms um, that are just like me and we're all really, really concerned. Where do you market your products, your produce? 
So we wholesale through Deep Root Organic Co-op. Okay. Um, we also sell to Hunger Men. <coughs> we sell to uh, Farmers to You. We do a farmer's market in Morrisville. Um, we market out to all the little other little co-ops and grocery stores. Um, you know, I wanted to mention too, for years we we donated a ton of produce to, we were farmer of the year for years for the Vermont Food Bank because we were able to donate hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of produce. You don't have the staff anymore to be able to, to grow that extra food. So, you know, we, we tighten everything up. We still donate as much as we can. Um, but there is, a, it affects a lot. Um, a bad weather year can just completely, you know, where we were able in years to be able to kind of weather those fluctuations where financially not as able to weather them. How many acres do you have in cultivation at this point? Uh, between 35 and 40. Yeah. And is, are you primary, <coughs> do you primarily hire um, at uh, harvest season? Is that when your uh, payroll is the highest? So do you realize that at thirteen seventy five, I think you said? Thirteen twenty five. Thirteen twenty five at your H two A minimum wage is two years away from the schedule that's paying um, what would re be required of you two years from now as a minimum wage. Do you understand that? Are you aware of that? I do understand yeah. that. And when you're at thirteen twenty five, uh -huh. we'll be at fifteen something because the H two A minimum wage yeah. is is connected directly to each state's minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So every state has a different H-2A minimum wage mm -hmm. as well. Okay. So it's, it's usually average $1.50 to $2 higher than um, the, the minimum state. wage of the state, yes. Representative Kalaki. Um, I thought in the bill we're looking at, and it continues, is that agricultural workers are exempt from the minimum wage of Vermont. That is correct, unless you are. So how does that work for you? So I understand. So because we are part of the H-2A oh, program, right. um, that makes us kind of not exempt anymore. Okay. Um, and I understand, you know, that's a choice that we made, um, but it's a choice that we we couldn't live without. You had to. We had to. We don't have people asking to work on the farm anymore. And if they do, I promise you, if somebody comes to our farm and they want to try it out and they want to work on our farm, we absolutely give everybody a chance to try it out. I would say about one out of five workers that come, which again, we really don't have those people coming anymore, but, but if they do, only one out of five generally stay with us. And then even if they do stay with us for a year, they're not returning the next year or the year after that. It might be just to get them through um, their season because they're a ski instructor or something along those lines. But um, we, the, the H-2A program is really vital for us. Um, if we lost that, I, we really wouldn't be able to grow vegetables for sure. And the H-2A program is a program in which you can you uh, hire migrant workers. Um, and could you explain a little bit more to the committee in case that they're not totally aware of it? Sure. Um, that is correct. Our, I, I don't know everything about that program, but what I will tell you is there are 55 of those farms in Vermont. Mm -hmm. 55 are using this program. There are over 500 workers um, working in the state of Vermont every year. Um, we usually get them uh, May 1st, and they stay until middle of November. Um, our workers come from Jamaica. Uh, three of them will be with us for the um, fifth year this year. Um, so that, or fourth year. Um, so that is, to have that kind of experience um, and to have them return every year, like we are kind of their second home. Um, and and we, we don't want to do it without them. They're part of our family. Like we, they're, so not having the H2H program is also yeah. um, not. We provide lodge, lodging and food. For we these provide lodging. Markets, yeah. um, we do not have to provide food, but we do have dinners together quite often. Um, but lodging, we have to pay for them to fly here. <coughs> uh, we have to pay for them to fly home. Yeah. Um, you know, their heat, their water, their electricity, <coughs> their internet, all of that we, we take care of. It's a very expensive program to be in. Um, but again, we, we really couldn't do it without them. The benefit 
is certainly worth it. And, and in, 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 in uh, consistency or, or longevity of employment, I mean, certainly people come back and understand and know your process and your, and your uh, work um, are a considerable advantage. Yes, and yeah. they they come here with experience too, and I think uh -huh. that that's important. Um, yeah. When we have folks that are in college and they want to come to our farm, we're paying them. We have to pay them thirteen twenty five, of course, as well. They don't have any experience, so we have to train them and use all our resources to get them trained. Um, but they don't have any experience, so these guys have a ton of experience. Mm -hmm. um, and they they know how to go out in the field and pick and weed and do all the things that we need them to do, um, we really need them. So with the wage tied to uh, Vermont's minimum wage, uh, and Vermont's minimum wage will, would go up to uh, 11, 25 next year or so, what increment would you be experiencing um, in your obligation to pay under uh, the H-2A program? Do you know, or is it? <clears throat> I'm not sure how the federal government sets those wages, uh -huh. but I know that every year it's been just about two dollars. So, if we're at 13, you know, we were at twelve eighty six last year. This uh -huh. year we're at thirteen twenty five. Yeah. So it seems like it raises just a, around the same amount as. And the we're Vermont. at ten seventy eight right now. Yeah. Okay. So it's, and that happens annually. Yes. And you get a notice from the federal government to that effect. Um. Yes, we yeah. use an agency okay. that that, uh, you know, helps us yeah. get through all of the paperwork and such. So okay. they. They let us know. This is what you have to do as yep. soon as they. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> okay. okay now, Joey, thanks very much for coming here. I appreciate your input. And we hear this. Oh, Earhart is next. Okay, Earhart. Welcome. You've been here before. No need for introductions. I have. Okay. We've done that two times. Yeah. Yes. It's been a while though. You guys have been okay. very busy. Well, nothing's changed. Non-housing relates. Not. Okay. So, housing relates to everything. Yes. Uh, thanks for the record. Uh, I'm Erhard Maka, testifying on behalf of the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition uh, in support of uh, the minimum wage increase. Does anybody need a um, hard copy of our handout? Anyone? So um, the handout that's uh, up on the board uh, is one that I think you've seen before, uh, at least some of, some of you have, um, and basically my testimony is going to be around housing, housing affordability and uh, why, uh, what the gap is um, between what folks who are working at minimum wage uh, jobs um, and all around at the low, lower wage service sector jobs, uh, what they can and can't afford uh, given our housing market and housing affordability issues. And all of that is to say that um, we uh, strongly, we've always strongly supported increases in the minimum wage because there has been a long standing gap between uh, what folks who are working 40, uh, 50, and sometimes 60 hours a week at uh, low wage service sector jobs, what they can afford and what's available on the market. Um, and that gap has been there for pretty much as long as I've been involved in, uh, in affordable housing. And um, some of the ways that we've helped to fill that gap, um, you know well, um, we build more affordable housing, uh, which we fund through the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. Um, we provide federal and state rental assistance um, with public dollars to help fill that gap. Um, but obviously another way to help uh, make up the difference is to raise, uh, is for people to be earning more. Um, our basic feeling is that people working hard 40 hours a week uh, should be able to afford a basic uh, life necessity and uh, what we consider a basic human right, uh, namely uh, safe and, and um, decent, uh, decent housing. So I'll just go over um, a few of these numbers just to uh, kind of make the point of what that uh, what that gap, uh, what that gap is, um, <clears throat> and this is information from an annual study by our national association, the National Income Housing Coalition. It's called Out of Reach. It comes out usually in May or June every year. So unfortunately, all I have is 2018 numbers. Uh, 2019 will be coming out probably after uh, you folks adjourn. 
And um, this is just to kind of refresh, this is based on an affordability standard that if you're paying more than 30% of your income for your shelter costs and for rental housing, uh, that includes utilities. So um, when we're talking about affordability here, we're talking about gross rent, so rent and, and utilities, your, your, total, uh, your total cost to rent, rent the unit. Um, so if you're paying more than 30% of your income, uh, you don't have enough left over for other basic life necessities. You're, uh, if you're paying 40, 50, 60, and you know, we have examples of people paying 70% of their uh, disposable income for their shelter costs, they're a step away from homelessness, um, at, uh, which will ultimately result, result not just in you know, a difficult situation for that family or that individual involved, but ultimately uh, will also uh, cost the state more money to help those uh, families, those individuals, um, take, get themselves out of the spiral, uh, the downward spiral of, of, of homelessness. Um, so one of the standards that the um, out of reach study uh, uses is what we call the housing wage. Um, the housing wage is what you would need to earn uh, on an hourly basis if you're working 52 weeks uh, a year, 40, 40 hours a week. Uh, in order to not, to not pay more than 30% of your income uh, for a typical two-bedroom rent. Um, so for 2018, uh, average statewide for Vermont, that was $22.40 uh, an hour. Uh, obviously, that's already considerably higher than the $15 an hour minimum wage that um, you would, if the bill passes both chambers signed by the governor, then you would get to um, by 2024. But uh, I think it makes the point that there is a very large, very large gap, and whatever you can do to uh, help decrease that gap um, would, in, in our view, would be uh, would be helpful. So that 22.40 an hour is the statewide average um, housing wage, um, and that's uh, based on a um, two-bedroom uh, typical two-bedroom apartment rent, gross rent again, including utilities of, um, and this was last year's number, it's actually gone up for this year. Um, it's uh, based on an average two bedroom rent of $1,165 uh, a month. Uh, obviously, rent is higher in the Chicken County area, it's higher in the uh, upper, uh, upper uh, some towns, the upper Connecticut River Valley, lower in the Northeast Kingdom, lower in Rutland, Bennington counties. Um, and so um, in the bottom left-hand corner, um, you see uh, some of the other housing wages. Uh, Burlington, South Burlington, it's a whopping $27.73 an hour. Um, for Windsor County, $20.65 an hour. Washington, $20.46 an hour. Uh, Addison, um, skipping over $19.63 an hour. Um, there's actually a further breakdown, because um, obviously not all the counties are there. On page two, um, I can get to that in a, in a moment. Uh, where all the counties are, are basically broken down as to what their housing wage is, and you can get a sense of the gap, uh, the affordability gap for, for renters in those in, in uh, each of your um, your, your <coughs> local areas. Um, and just to highlight a couple of other data points on the first page of this, um, so to afford that two bedroom, that typical two bedroom uh, rental uh, apartment, you would have to work 85 hours um, a week at uh, at our current uh, at our current minimum wage. Uh, for a one-bedroom apartment, you would have to work 68 hours a week at, um, uh, at, at our current minimum wage. And I'll, I'll just say, obviously, if you have two wagers in, in a household, then um, you could probably uh, afford that uh, two-bedroom apartment uh, by working not much more than 40 hours a week each. But if you're a single parent, um, you're in, you're, you're you're tough luck um, because you really can't afford a two. If you're a single mom or a single dad with uh, a couple kids, you need a two-bedroom apartment. Um, you're going to have to be working um, way, way more than you ought to be just to afford a basic life necessity. Um, for renters, we have um, approximately 75,000 renter households in the state of Vermont. Um, we have a very high home ownership rate, one of the highest in the country. 71% of our households are homeowners. 29%. Uh, our, our, our renters, the uh, rent affordable uh, with a full-time job paying the uh, mean renter wage. So the mean renter wage is you know, half of our renters would earn above that, half below. Uh, the rent that's affordable is $668 uh, a month. Um, so that is 
uh, literally um, um, just over um, half of the typical two-bedroom uh, apartments. So there's a, a very large gap, about a um, $500 gap uh, between what the um, mean rent, rent a wage pays in Vermont and what um, what is affordable on a statewide basis. We have a question there. Right. Sorry. Go ahead. So uh, no, 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 no problem. Just I, I want to ask a question while we're on this topic. So of the number that applied to the rental price, I guess I, I guess what my question is, what are you basing on as like a percentage of income being allocated to rent to quantify that number of the thirty percent, it's a long standing industry standard, um, you know, in, in mortgage underwriting, it's okay. you know, roughly equivalent to <coughs> in a home ownership situation to you know twenty-eight percent of uh, your income going for principal interest tax insurance and rental housing. Okay. It's a uh, all the uh, affordable housing programs that are federally funded use that standard. It's a so what the, 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 the remaining percentage of uh, getting up to 100 percent, how does that break down as far as like estimated expenses? I mean, obviously, it's like, but, but like, what are the big buckets in that? Where they um, well, you know, I, I'm not prepared to talk about all the different aspects of your basic, you know, your basic needs um, study. Joint fiscal does that every other year for you, but, you know, uh, if you look at the Vermont specific study that, that um, JFO does, it includes um, a lot of nuances about you know different size uh, families, whether it's one person, two person, with child, with, without children, um, and uh, whether or not it's rural or, or not. So we do have Vermont specific information around basic needs that is not as uh, not as focused on housing, but the other aspects of this. If you have children, obviously childcare is a huge expense in some situations. Uh, childcare can be a greater expense than housing if you live further out. Um, from a job center, your transportation mm -hmm. costs are going to be higher. In fact, there's a, almost an inverse uh, relationship between housing costs and transportation costs. Housing costs are higher, closer to job centers. Uh, transportation lower if you you know live close to jobs, and if you're in a more rural area, living further away from uh, a job center, you're paying more for transportation. So there's there's kind of it's actually some indices yeah, that so combine the same way into our like horrible public transportation system. Well, like, there yeah, in a rural state, we have a lot of challenges. Yeah. Okay. So. Representative Kalaki has a question. Well, Eric, explain to me that uh, the living wage because right, it's thirteen eighty three or something. What is it? What is it? 1343. 1343. Thank you. So, what's the what's the different calibration here that this one is? So, <coughs> so this is higher. this is solely focused on housing, mm -hmm. right. and that that is I would say more nuanced because it does include all these other yeah. uh, all the other costs that uh, represent by own is you know, was just referring to or, or, or asking uh, asking about. So I would say it's it's more nuanced in that you know there's a breakdown between rural non rural uh, between different household sizes. Um, this is, um, I would say, you know, this study is one that's done nationally, and it's for every jurisdiction in the county, so it's for every metropolitan statistical area. They don't get into quite the same nuances that our uh, basic needs study that JFO does you know, every two years. Okay. But it's solely focused on housing and assuming that in order to pay the other basic life necessities, you need the other 70% of, uh, of your income. Thank you. Representative Kango has a question. I apologize for my voice, but I've always found it very curious that the Burlington, South Burlington MSA includes Franklin County yeah. and Grand Isle County. Yeah. So what is the logic behind us to know any of that? And seriously, <coughs> Burlington, South Burlington costs would be much higher if you backed out the other two counties. So um, I, uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, this is uh, a construct that uh, OMB, the Office of Management uh, and Budget at the federal level, has come up with. A number of years ago, before the Metropolitan Statistical Area was redefined, it actually singled out certain towns in Franklin and Grand Isle counties that were within easy commuting distance and were arguably, could much more logically and plausibly be considered part of the Burlington, South Burlington job market. But yeah, including Richford or right. you know, uh, Innisburg in, in this, um, it's, 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 it's a stretch. It's, 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 yeah. Thank you. I, I can't defend it. Um, I can't defend it. And, and it does, as you point out, it does weird things to the fair market yes. rents because um, if you did subtract out, um, you know, the really far flung towns of you know both Grand Isle and Franklin counties, the Burlington South Burlington fair market rents would probably be significantly higher. Mm -hmm. And 
expanding on that, that if we were able to do that, that would give us some more accurate data for Richmond, Enosburg, those types of Albert, um, so that we would know what people need to make for a wage yeah. in those towns in order to afford to live there. T totally, um, I, I totally agree with you. And, and actually, not to get into the like completely wonky side of, of, of housing policy, um, we actually saw an, uh, HUD set fair market rents way too low. Um, they set reset them every October first mm -hmm. for the uh, for the following f the federal fiscal year. Um, they were significantly below market in virtually every area of the state, including the MSA, uh, and uh, agencies had to get together and raise $70,000 to appeal that. And part of it, uh, part of the problem is that the MSA is just misdefined. Uh, it should not include those towns. Yeah, I would be very surprised if people at Richford need to make Twenty-seven seventy-three an hour yeah. to live there. Yeah, <coughs> totally agree with you. But conversely, yeah. South Burlington would be right. higher. Would, would be higher. Could be. Um, I, I, and again, it's this is not as nuanced as you know a state-based study uh, that the Joint Fiscal Office does. You know, which slices and dices different family sizes and where you know, where they're where they're located. Um, so, and, and just on that first page, the last thing I'll just uh, I'll just point to is. Um, the uh, rent that's affordable to somebody at 30% of area median income, which is a, another standard that um, we use in housing, uh, 30, anyone below 30% of uh, area median income is considered extremely low income. Um, so that household can afford $576 a month uh, in rent. And again, I would contrast that with the $1,165 as the statewide average. That's approximately $23,000 a year. Um, and so that translates roughly into 1150 an hour. So we're talking someone at minimum wage, uh, at current minimum wage in Vermont, um, if, they're, if they're working, uh, they're below that 30% standard uh, and they're uh, considered by federal standards to be extremely low income. Uh, I'll, I'll just, um, if we could, I don't know who's got a, um, a hat, thank you. Um, just briefly, um, just wanted to show you page two in this. Um, a lot of numbers on this page, but basically if you look at the extreme left-hand column, um, those are the counties alphabetically uh, ordered, and then you can go across on the rows to see, you know, first column is what the um, housing wage is for each of the individual counties, and then there's additional uh, data on uh, income, um, both housing costs, area median income, and uh, how that breaks out for renters uh, in, the, in the individual counties. So we have another question, Eric. From yeah, just Matt. just a curiosity again about the numbers back on page one. So the, the two bedroom housing wage at twenty two forty. Um, so would it be safe to say that like two single individuals making thirteen bucks an hour fall comfortably into that number? That yeah, again, if you have two low wage service sector workers, you know, at that at that rate. Um, they would, but if you're a single parent um, and you've got one wage earner in the family, you're... Well, no, 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 I understand that, but I mean, it's like you're... you're yes. You're, yeah. you're really speaking to one unique situation or one defined situation, where there's a lot of other defined situations under this umbrella. There, there, yeah. there are. Okay. Clearly. Cool. Just wanted to clear that. Um, and then the rest of the packet that, um, that's on your website just... Uh, quickly uh, shows where Vermont stands um, with respect to the housing wage vis-a-vis uh, -vis other uh, states around the country. We, are, uh, we have the 13th highest housing wage among all states, so we're basically the 13th least affordable state. Um, and then um, there's a, a further uh, page. The next page shows um, what uh, breaks down sort of the top 10 worst jurisdictions uh, based on a couple of different uh, criteria, um, if you look at the one, scroll back one. Um, oh, maybe mine might be in a slightly different order. That's the one, sorry. So lower left-hand corner, the state non-metropolitan area. So this is everything outside of the metropolitan statistical area, which I would you know, include some uh, very rural areas in the MSA. I would say this is basically all the counties outside of the three northwest counties. Um, and there we are, um, together with other New England states, we have the hot, basically the most expensive rural uh, areas in the, in the country um, uh, behind uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Hampshire. So what are we, one, two, three, four, 
we're, we're sixth worst uh, state for, for rural areas. And then the other, um, this one, um, shows uh, that for renters, we have the fifth largest gap um, between what your um, renter, earning the mean um, renter wage can afford and the two bedroom housing wage. Uh, and again, we're in good company with the rest of, with most of the rest of New England, New England being a very, very high cost, uh, high cost area. Um, and on the last page, I'll, I'll just quickly point out, these are um, on the left hand side, um, those are National Bureau of um, Labor Statistics numbers, they're not state <laughs> numbers, but it, it'll give you an idea of just you know, some of the typical, um, and I think this is pretty true for Vermont too, although the dollar amounts, obviously, food preparation and service at 989 is, and, and uh, waiters and waitresses at 1020, those are below our current uh, minimum wage, so again, these are national numbers, but it'll give you, you know, at least I think some idea of um, the types of uh, jobs that don't pay uh, the, um, the housing wage and, and that are, are going to be jobs where people are struggling to make ends meet. Um, so I'll just conclude um, by um, just pointing out that basically, you know, getting back to my earlier uh, statement, one of the ways that we fill uh, the gap, uh, the affordability gap, is with public subsidies. And so um, in order to help, um, and, and that's always going to be necessary, but one of the other ways that we can help fill the gap is by having, uh, paying people more. Um, and I think if we raise the minimum wage, even though we would, we would certainly like to see it raised more aggressively to, um, to help um, decrease that, that gap. But, um, and, and I'm not saying you know, if we raise the minimum wage that we're going to need to spend less public dollars on, on uh, subsidies. Um, but I, I mean, the point is clear is that part of what we're doing is we are, um, by not uh, paying people enough, um, we are uh, having to subsidize more folks um, with things like rental assistance. Um, and um, without, without that rental assistance uh, and or without increases uh, in pay for our lowest paid workers, um, these folks are uh, you know, one step away from uh, missing, uh, missing rent and potentially uh, being subject to eviction and spiraling into, into homelessness. Any other questions? Very hard. Seeing none, thank, thank you very hard. hard. Thank you. It's good to hear from you. Appreciate your time. Yeah. And now we're looking for Virginia Renfro. Virginia. <laughs> Welcome, Virginia. <laughs> I got this earlier this morning, and all the Vermonters <laughs> caucus, you know everyone here? Um, I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, thank you, I'm Virginia Renfrew, and I work with the uh, Vermont Association of Adult Days. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with what an adult day is, it's, it's part of the long-term care, Choices for Care um, program. And when you think of an adult day, um, Think of a nursing home, but the people go home at nighttime. Um, adult days enable people to uh, be at home with their families, their loved ones, and then uh, at nighttime, and then in the day, be with the adult day. Um, adult days have um, are required by the um, Dale standards to have a nurse on staff. They provide um, medical services, you know, showers. Um, and uh, as you can see on this chart, they provide uh, you know many different things. Some people arrive in an adult day at seven in the morning, and they're there till four or five at night. So they're getting their breakfast, their um, lunch, and a snack. Um, so we want you to know that um, the uh, association supports the intent of. Uh, S23. We believe that employees should be paid a fair and livable wage. The concern that we have is that with a reimbursement rate of $16.40 an hour, that um, we're not quite sure how, how we're going to be able to continue to do this um, and run these programs with this type of reimbursement uh, rate. And um, adult days depend about 75% 
of the, um, their funding comes through Medicaid. We have seen over the last few years a much higher acuity of the people who are attending the adult days. So sometimes staff needs, you know, you need to have two or three people um, helping one participant. So, and we, in the testimony that uh, I've submitted, you know, lists all the different things as the chart does as well. And so, uh, what we would ask is that uh, you consider to add language, and uh, um, we support the language that the uh, VNA brought in, Jill Olson, and we would ask you to consider having some, either the language that has been proposed or some type of language to make sure that the Medicaid rates keep up with the minimum wage in order to ensure that these programs can continue to serve the monitors. Great. Any questions? Yes. Oh. Yes. 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 Um, <laughs> okay, Don? The, um, <laughs> Have you take have have you been to either the health care committee or the human services committee or the appropriations committee to discuss the lack of Medicaid reimbursement in anticipation of this or in um, reference to just current services? I know I, I know that we feel like in general that the services are undercapitalized, um, but have you have you made the rounds this year? I've had the conversation in Senate Appropriations with the chair, um, and I think that, you know, um, I did not have this conversation in Senate Health and Welfare, but I think that they're aware of this, um, and House Appropriations this year uh, included in their budget a 2% increase for the um, home and community-based Providers, um, I will say that at 1640 an hour, that will bring them up to 1680 percent. <coughs> so when we look at, you know, in order to bring our rate up higher, um, we're probably looking at about a 25 percent. And we haven't, I haven't gathered that da data yet, but I would say that in order to meet this. The problem that you have right now is that if you have someone who's been working for you for, you know, three or four years at, you know, thirteen dollars an hour, and now you know each year we're bringing people up, you have to raise them all. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is because we do have to have the adult days have to have an RN on staff, they pay between thirty to thirty-five dollars an hour to have that RN on staff. So. Yes, we in over the last few years we've had this conversation um, and really feeling that um, I think that people hear us but not quite sure where they're going to find the money and so um, feeling that having this language added into S23 will hopefully make a difference. How many adult daycare services are there? There's 14 in the state. They're in every county except for Grand Island. And who exactly who, who runs them? So there's um, out of the 14, um, 13 of them are independent. So they're nonprofits, um, and three of them are part uh, Springfield Hospital, which isn't doing so well. Uh, Rutland Hospital and yeah, I think just two hospitals and then the Burlington, there's three adult days <coughs> under the VNA. And so the average salary is, Well, I guess it's hard to say with that. <laughs> what is the average salary of the lowest paid workers? Well, right now it's whatever your minimum wage is. And are they full-time or part-time? They're full-time. And many of them are, do receive um, uh, health benefits and vacation time. Okay. Um, no, it's just it's just another you know it's just another tough balance between you know, and the provision of important services and the compensation for the people who provide those important services. It's very difficult to. Um, 
live in poverty and absolutely you know, and so. we you know and I think that you know one of the things you know certainly listening to Earhart's testimony is that you know that is a huge issue and again I think that you know for adult days or home health you know we would all be you know like to be able to pay um, our uh, you know pay their their staff a you know, livable wage I think that um, you know, one thing with adult days is that we have a very low turnover. So the people who are working right now for the adult days are very committed to the people who are attending there. Um, but what they're finding is that when someone, you know, either decides to retire or leave, you know, whatever, it, they're hard to fill those spots because the pay is, it, is low and that uh, we're competing against higher pay and totally understandable, but um, I think that as our population continues to grow older in the state, that the state of Vermont needs to really think about how we can ensure that we have these services to provide for our elderly in you know, this fall. Okay, last question. So you, when you said 25% <coughs> increase in budget, I'm assuming that's over time, That's a, so that four years from now, that budget just for salaries would represent a 25% increase over what they are now. Is that is that the right way to look at that? Yeah, I know for the reimbursement rate, what would we be looking? Yes, we would be looking for, and and that's one of the things that I'm doing right now is working with the adult days so that next year we can go to the appropriations committee with exactly how much we need to to have increase to meet if if this bill becomes law, um, how, how to meet that. And But you don't have a number of what that represents? I don't like that. Okay. And it seems to me that a RN on staff being paid $30 an hour would not fit into your wage compression that you're speaking about. Right. And that's a pay level that is, is substantial and I'm sure um, adequate for yeah, that's, I mean, that's really the, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, some are paying higher, and uh -huh. I know that I one of that. the adult days has been struggling, and the director herself is a nurse, and so she, her nurse has left, and she has now, she's doing, running the place and being, being the nurse. Uh -huh. And are they coming in from an agency, these uh, are attempts through an agency? So you're paying direct? Paying. Okay, good, yeah. Anyone else? Thanks, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, and moving to uh, Colin Robinson. Welcome, Colin. I don't think you've been here in this room before this year? Not this year. Okay, yeah. so we'll introduce ourselves. Right. I'm uh, Chip Troiano. I, I represent Hardware Standard in Walden. I'm Steve from Waterbury, uh, representing Waterbury, Bolton, Huntington, and Buell Score. Representative Matt Myron, Virginia, uh, Stairsburg, Kenny, Walton, and Addison. I'm Lazat from Barner. Lisa Hango, Berkshire, Richford, Franklin, and Huggy. Representative Mary Ann Mush from Selection, Representative Sheldon. John Kalaki, South Carolina. Tommy Walls, Irving City. Mary Howard, Bratland City. Thank you all. Welcome. Great. Um, so for the record, my name is Colin Robinson. I'm the political director at Vermont NEA. Thanks for having us here today and allowing us to share some thoughts. Vermont NEA uh, supports S23. Uh, we are a union that represents 13,000 school employees, teachers, and school support <coughs> in every community across the state. Um, as a core principle, we believe every worker, whether they're unionized or not, should be allowed to meet their basic needs every single day. And increasing and having a strong minimum wage as a core value, we believe, allows Vermonters <coughs> to address that. There are two specific issues that I wanted to speak to as it relates to the bill that you're considering. First of all, we represent um, several thousand, about 3,000 school support staff. These are bus drivers, food service workers, paraeducators, custodians, maintenance uh, individuals. And they are not 
necessarily surprisingly the lowest paid employees in our schools. But they provide incredibly important work and support to our students. They literally feed them, they clean up after them, and they provide critical uh, additional educational supports to students inside the classroom as well. And obviously the support staff that we represent do have uh, the opportunity and they are collectively bargaining with their employers about wages, hours, and working conditions. Um, some of their contracts, some of our members' contracts that they negotiate across the state have starting wages that are below $15 an hour. Some have starting wages that are above $15 an hour. And where individuals are on those salary schedules depends obviously on how long they've been employed, what their position is, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing I did want to highlight as it specifically relates to this component of the education workforce is actually a study that was shared with this committee last year. Um, for those of you who weren't here, uh, I have provided um, Ron with an electronic copy of the study. I would encourage you to read it. But it was written by Professor Rebecca Gibbon uh, from Rutgers University. And it was titled Women's Work. Education Voices of Vermont's Educators, and sort of a survey of the Vermont education workforce. Um, and if you'll bear with me, I'd like to sort of read a, a component of that. She was talking about all uh, educators in Vermont. But in her report, she wrote, in Vermont, 87% of paraprofessionals are women. Our data revealed that 39% are the primary wage earners in their household. Many express frustration over the widespread misconception that paraprofessionals are wives trying to pick up extra work with the implicit assumption that the salary does not need to cover the full cost of living. Fewer than one in three paraprofessionals are able to survive on this income. Close to two-thirds of paraprofessionals, 63%, work an additional job during the school year. 68% of paraprofessionals work during, uh, work during the summer when school is closed, and over half of these employees, 57%, work additional jobs both during the school year and the summer. The rea reality is that paraprofessionals are struggling economically, yet their schools depend on them uh, to support essential educational needs. One paraprofessional spoke of the frustration living with roommates in her 40s, describing it as degrading. And uh, to complement some of the comments from Earhart earlier, uh, you can see this quote specifically from a paraeducator in Chittenden County that uh, Professor Gibbon spoke to. She said, uh, it is assumed that paraprofessionals have a partner or are married, essentially that there is a two-person income supporting you. The lowest low wages make it really tough to do this job and be on your own. Until I got my second job, there were some days I actually came home and went to bed hungry. I had about enough to pay my rent, and that was from a paraeducator in Chittenden County. So this is just a snapshot from that report, and this is just a snapshot of some of the lowest wage um, school employees that serve in communities across our state. Um, I also, just point of information, you may not be aware that if you are a school employee, you're not eligible for unemployment. So uh, paraeducators aren't collecting unemployment during the summer months. Um, that's under federal law, something that they're not eligible for. Um, so there's no doubt that S23 would uh, impact positively school support staff and their ability to meet their own basic needs, which allows them to come prepared to schools to support their students. The second point that I wanted to lift up is going to be pretty obvious, but as you all know, our members work every single day to make sure students are able to be successful in the classroom, but a student can't be successful if they don't have food in their stomach, they're concerned about where they're going to sleep that night, and the other basic needs in their life aren't being addressed. Our members work every single day to bring in extra food to support those students, to bring in weather appropriate clothes to clothe those students, to connect those students and their families with uh, social service needs that might be able to help students be successful. But at the end of the day, yes, but at the end of the day, if a student isn't able to have those basic needs met, they're not going to be able to be prepared to learn in the classroom. So we believe S23 and increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour will help ensure that um, students impacted by poverty are able to better have their family's basic needs met met and students are going to be able to come to school and learn, thrive, five and uh, get the education that they deserve. So sorry to interrupt you. No, absolutely. That those are my remarks. Representative Stevens, then Representative Hanko. 
So I think I've known this by just by practice, but tell me about a federal law that says that a paraprofessional does not rec cannot receive unemployment during the summer months. It's it's just a specific carve out for school employees and federal unemployment law. So do they pay unemployment time. taxes and the premiums? Uh, that's actually I that's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head. I would assume if they're ineligible, um, then they don't. But I I don't want to say that definitively. But that's a carve out in federal law. I mean, if I know that the local granite industry, for instance, has contracts that plan unemployment into their contract where they expect people to take a, 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 a month off in the, you know, right. in the, in the winter time mm -hmm. um, where they do get unemployment. I mean, that's part of a business plan for, for that industry. So one, one thing that uh, I can't remember the exact year you all, the legislature moved forward, but it was in the past eight years. Um, we heard from our members who were basically saying that they wanted to stretch their pay out over the calendar year. So teachers right now can select to receive their salary over the course of the school year or have it spread out through the summer to help them with their family budgeting purposes and meeting their needs. Um, school support staff, because they're not, because of their circumstances, um, and their wages were not necessarily able to request that of school districts because then if you actually parse out their wages, it brings it below the state minimum wage. And so our members came in here and worked with uh, some of you and your predecessors to pass a law that um, allowed for even pay for school employees, low wage school employees, to opt into receiving their payment, their, their pay, over the course of an entire calendar year, even though that hourly wage might actually end up dipping below what the state minimum wage is. So they would be able to manage their um, family resources more appropriately throughout uh, the entire calendar year. Uh, Representative Hango. <coughs> Um, oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, from a school board standpoint, during negotiations, it's very difficult to balance all of the needs that a school has when you're crafting a budget and you're negotiating with a teachers or a support staff union. So, obviously, raising wages um, is going to raise that budget. We have many, many people who pay for school taxes through their property tax. So this is their, their life savings is in their homestead. <laughs> They're paying taxes um, that are going to go up as a result of this. What do we tell our constituents who are in that situation where they're retired, mm -hmm. they own a decent property, mm -hmm. and their taxes are just going higher and higher? Uh, I appreciate the question. I think there are sort of two uh, answers that I'll, two different components of the answer I'll give you. One is that I think, I'm sure you've heard from others, but we do know that low wage workers spend their money locally. So in so much as uh, low wage, uh, pair, pair professionals and other school uh, support staff are more likely to live in the communities in which they work than say a teacher, a teacher might drive 30 or 40 minutes, than a pair educator who's working in the school in their in their town. So on a basic level, uh, our lowest wage school employees will be able to spend that additional resources in their home community, um, which we believe has an added economic benefit. On the education funding side of things, this is specific to your question, but tangential to the uh, issue at hand. Um, at Vermont NEA, we've actually been um, supportive of a proposal to move away from the residential, eliminate the residential income tax, and move to um, a fully income-based system for the residential component of our education funding system because we think those with the ability to pay should be able to pay their fair share. Um, Low-income and middle-income Vermonters right now pay about 2% of their income towards school funding, <clears throat> and uh, individuals with more means don't say pay the same proportion of their income towards making sure our schools are able to support our students. And we believe that everybody should. Thank you. Representative Byron. I think you next. <clears throat> um, 
Representative Hagel kind of touched on a chunk of what I was going to ask. Um, so I guess I have some little like some question. So what percentage of your membership would be impacted? We would see wage increases if, if this bill was to pass. Uh, a third of our, or sorry, a quarter of our members are school support staff. Yeah. Um, but within that category, you have folks that are, you know, in a school maintenance unit, <coughs> you actually have a plumber who's making twenty-five or dollars an hour or more. Yeah, yeah, like the ground supervisor. Exactly. I mean, there are individuals. So um, sitting here right now, I actually can't tell you specifically because it is really individual mm -hmm. in terms of where they're placed on the salary schedule. And we don't have a full comprehensive set of where every single school support staff member is currently on their salary okay. schedule. In so that would be a, like a better question for my school board? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And Representative Clacky. And our, uh, the support staff, is this a statewide contract or is it school district by school district? Um, school district by school district. Um, and of this 25% of your member, mm -hmm. how many are currently by contract earning less than the minimum wage that's being proposed in this bill? Below $15 an hour. Well, that's five years. Right. Um, well, currently none of the contracts have wages that are below the state minimum wage. Um, and of course, as salary schedules work, people tend to move up yeah. as they go throughout the year. Um, sitting here right now, I don't have the exact number of, okay, these are the 10 contracts in the school that have a wage that uh, doesn't go above $15 an hour. I can say the salary schedules, as to the best of my knowledge, all go above $15 an hour. Many start above $15 an hour. Um, they don't end at fifteen dollars an hour. I'm not following. Okay. So if, let me try and say it again. If, if all if, here's what I heard. And yes. I heard. <coughs> Great. If if all of the support staff is already earning above minimum wage, why is this a stance for you? If, if everyone's already taken care of in the union negotiation, I, I that's, maybe I misunderstand. Thanks. Right. No, no, the, I understand your question. Um, well, two things. We don't know. Obviously, this bill has a time horizon that's several years out, and we don't know where uh, the salary schedule will be at that point. Um, some have starting wages that are above fifteen dollars an hour. Some do not. So, in so much as that there are contracts that have starting wages for school support staff that are below fifteen dollars an hour, this will impact them. Um, where specific individuals will be on that salary schedule, as I mentioned to Representative Byron's question, we don't know. Um, so we, we do believe that increasing this will have impacts on our members and be incorporated into conversations about uh, negotiations. Uh, I will also say that, you know, as mentioned earlier by Virginia Renfrew about issues related to compression. And that's something that we're, we're aware of, right? You know, if you've been a paraeducator for 10 years and you're making 15, 25 an hour, um, you know, that's something that we and our members at the local bargaining table will have to work out and figure out. But as a core principle, we believe that $15 an hour is, is a wage that everybody should, um, should benefit from. Thank you. Yeah, so sorry for the confusion. I heard you speak the other day, Colin, about um, health care costs. And um, currently, our, our um, school districts are under an 80 20 split mandated uh, by um, the state right now. Uh, and our um, non teacher, or, or these uh, paraprofessionals, and, and other folks that work in, in, in the school system, tell us about what their health care um, situation is, if you would. Um, so just point of clarification, <clears throat> there is no statutory language uh, around premium cost sharing for school employees, well, whether correct. teachers or support staff. Right. Uh, among teachers, there is not a tremendous amount of disparity. You know, in their local contracts right. across the state, it tends to be in this uh, 16 to 20 percent versus the you know 86 to uh, 80 percent. Uh, sorry, 84 to uh, 80 percent for schools. Among school support staff, it varies drastically across the state. Um, school support staff in some districts receive access to only single person coverage, 
um, healthcare benefits just for themselves. Um, some receive uh, access to all tiers of coverage, up to and including family coverage. Some, and I'll use Burlington as an example, um, they receive access to health care, but the premium cost share is basically split 60-40 versus support staff up in some districts in the Northeast Kingdom where it's closer to 95% um, five, picked up by the school district, 5% picked up by the employee. I think where their numbers are lower for school support staff, districts have recognized that these are the lowest paid workers and we want to make sure they have access to high quality affordable health care for them and their families. Um, Chittenden East, Green Mountain uh, Chittenden East District actually has an income sensitized premium structure for school support staff. So if you're in this band, you pay this percentage. If you're in this band, you pay this percentage. So it is all over the map, um, literally. Thanks. Representative Pango. Um, a couple of things. Um, Health care contracts mm -hmm. are going to be negotiated statewide mm -hmm. going forward after mm -hmm. this contract expires. Um, and that will not include support staff at, this, at that point in time. It does. it does. Okay. So teachers and support staff are going to be negotiated statewide. So there'll be some equity throughout the state for those types of situations. Um, support staff receiving benefits um, just under a single a single plan as opposed to a family plan. What we found in northern Vermont, northwestern Vermont, is that often if they had children, they were covered under a program such as Dr. Dynasty. Mm -hmm. So healthcare costs, um, while they seem extreme in some cases, that there's a disparity, may not, there may not be that big of a disparity when you look at the public benefits that some of those families are getting because they are low, low income people. And just to represent Pango's point, um, Dr. Dinosaur is a program that a lot of support staff, we, we hear from them as well, that they access and provides critical benefits to them and their families, and we know that it's actually really comprehensive and good coverage. Um, we were working on an effort a couple years ago to try and expand Dr. Dinosaur to all <coughs> Vermonters under age 26 because we believe it is a, a model program. Great. Any other questions for Colin? Uh, oh, one more. And it's actually isn't your organization, but it's in your. Um, I know, obviously, the NEA stands on this. Can you what the superintendents feel about this? I, I don't, and I, I don't feel comfortable speaking for them. Okay. Um, but totally fair. Yeah. That's what you're going to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not something, you know, uh, it's not something you've talked with them about as an yeah. association. Okay. Anyone else? Colin, thank you. Thank you all very much for taking the time. And right now it's uh, Kerry Brown, Executive Director for Vermont Commission on Women. Welcome, Kerry. Thank you very much. Okay. This is your first yeah. year, first time here this year? Um, no. No. Oh, no. that's right. No, I've been here before. Yes. Okay. So no introductions. It's been necessary. a little while though. It's been since the very, very beginning. It was early on. When there was snow know. on the ground. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it still is in some places. <laughs> like my house. Okay. I'm just gonna let that pass. <laughs> Thanks. Welcome. All right. Thank you for having me. For the record, Carrie Brown, Executive <laughs> Director of the Vermont Commission on Women. And um, I'm, we've been, the Vermont Commission on Women is an independent, nonpartisan state agency. We've been around since 1964, working on advancing rights and opportunities for women and girls in Vermont. And um, economic security has been one of our core issues from the get go, and I expect will remain so. And uh, we have for a long time recognized the link between increased wages and women's economic stability. We have policy statements that go back decades expressing our support for legislation, policies, programs, and initiatives that promote a livable income for Vermonters. And our, while we don't have a position on this particular bill, because that's just not really our MO, we have a um, recently updated statement about the minimum wage in general, which I'm going to read to you you can see where we're coming from. Given that women in Vermont are currently in a more precarious financial situation than men, and given that raising the minimum wage any amount would have a positive impact on many women, and given that raising women's earnings would have an additional positive impact on Vermont and its economy, the Vermont Commission on Women supports efforts to increase the minimum wage as one strategy for promoting a livable income for Vermonters. So 
that's just kind of where we're coming from. Um, and I will tell you as well that um, in coming to this statement and in discussing this issue among the, the, the large diversity of perspectives we have on the Vermont Commission on Women, many, many issues were raised. And there is a great recognition of the complexity of this <laughs> issue um, that doesn't necessarily come across in that simple policy statement. And uh, I know that you are wrestling with many of those complex questions, but um, I just have to, to, to say that we keep them in the front of our mind as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that as I, as I go on. So I just want to share some information with you about the connection between women's economic status and the minimum wage. So um, women's economic situation in Vermont is somewhat precarious. The median annual wage for all women in Vermont looking at full and part-time workers is just 15.03 an hour. So that's everybody. 43% of women who are working full-time in Vermont aren't making enough money to cover their basic needs. That's just full-time women. If we look at full-time and part-time workers, 57% of women aren't making enough to cover their basic needs. And if we look at single mothers with one child in Vermont, 86% of them don't make enough to cover their basic needs. And for single mothers with two or more children, 92% of them don't make enough. So um, practically all of them. And um, it's worth noting that in all these categories, the wage required to meet those basic needs is higher than $15 an hour. And this is based on the, the budget that the uh, Joint Fiscal Office comes out with. So raising the minimum wage would have a disproportionately positive impact on women in Vermont. More women than men are working in minimum wage jobs. Nationally, women make up about two-thirds of all minimum wage and tipped wage workers. Wages rise more for women than for men when the minimum wage goes up. In states that raised their minimum wage in 2015, all low wage workers saw their wages rise, but women's even more than men's. Women in the lowest income bracket saw their wages rise 5.2% in states that had a legislative increase, such as you're considering, compared to 4.7% for men. And so every, all those low wage workers went up, but women saw an even greater benefit. It was not equal for men and women. A higher minimum wage is linked to smaller pay gaps between men and women. A study conducted by the National Women's Law Center found that states with higher minimum wages have lower gender wage gaps. States with a minimum wage at or higher than $8.25 an hour have a wage gap about 41% smaller than those whose minimum wage wages are at $7.25 an hour. Raising the minimum wage would particularly help women of color who face larger wage gaps than white women and who are even more likely to earn the minimum wage. In Vermont, women working full time are 1.3 times as likely as men to earn less than 10 10 an hour. 17% of women compared to 13% of men. This, this, that number is a little bit old, let me say. That's a slightly outdated number because I think you know, you're wondering how can you be making less than 10 10 an hour. Of course, we do have people making less than minimum wage, but that's from a couple of years ago that we did that analysis. Okay. So that is 17% um, of women are making less than 10 10 an hour compared to 13% of men. And this was as of, this is uh, 2009 through 2013 data, so over those, those five years, which was the most recent that we had when we did this. And um, if we include part-time workers, so that was just full-time. Part-time workers, it's 28% of all women in Vermont, 27% um, of white women, 33% of women of color. So those gaps are higher for women. <coughs> and women in Vermont are over twice as likely as men to work in part-time jobs. 25% of women are, in Vermont are working part-time compared to, I think it's 11% of men or 11 point something percent of men. Part-time work is much more likely to pay a minimum wage nationally. Part-time workers are paid minimum wage at a rate three and a half times that of full-time workers. So raising women's earnings by whatever method would have a positive impact on Vermont and its economy. Closing the wage gap would reduce the poverty rate in Vermont by 57%. And the increase in wages for working women would equal about a billion dollars, equivalent to 3.3% of the state's GDP. Social security draws are based on earnings. <coughs> Raising the minimum wage would lead to Vermont workers receiving more benefits in retirement and would help to reduce future gender disparities and alleviate financial insecurity for Vermont seniors, which is pretty significant currently. Uh, Vermont women currently get about half in Social Security that Vermont men do. And that is because of 
inequities and disparities over a lifetime of earnings. <coughs> Nationally, among workers earning less than twelve sixteen an hour, every one dollar in hourly wages reduces the likelihood of receiving means-tested public assistance by three point one percent. So that means when that hourly wages go up, public assistance is going down. And the rate of women receiving public support is twice that of men in Vermont. So that's a lot more women that are impacted by that. And I spoke before about some things that we feel it's important for you to consider simultaneously as you're raising this wage. Um, of course, you've talked a lot about benefits cliffs, I'm sure, and that is a huge concern for the Commission on Women. Uh, so I'm sure you've talked about the minimum wage analysis that the um, Joint Fiscal Office did in 2014 that was warning about um, pushing families over benefit cliffs and, and reducing their available resources. The three primary program benefit reductions would be from the Vermont Child Care Financial Assistance Program, Three Squares Vermont, and the renter's rebate. And the single mothers are overwhelmingly, disproportionately, and seriously affected by these benefits cliffs. It's really, that's who's really feeling it. The people who, they see their income go up, their wages go up a little bit, and their overall resources go down because of lack of public benefits. It's single mothers who are really falling right in there. And so considering ways to, um, to address that at the same time as you're thinking about raising the wage is, um, I think, a, a absolutely critical. We're also pretty concerned about child care providers um, who are mostly women and uh, they may find themselves in a difficult situation needing to significantly increase the pay to their workers without accompanying increases in the revenues available to those higher wages. Uh, this is a system that is somewhat closed, right, in terms of who you're serving, who your customers are, and where the revenue is coming from. And so if the revenue coming from parents is maxed out, which I think a lot of research shows us that it is, then revenue has to come from somewhere else in order to increase the wages that are being spent. And so that I know that is something that you're considering as you're, as you're looking at this, but it's just something we want to emphasize. As well as in any other systems like this where the revenue is primarily coming from, not com coming from the clients who are being served, but coming through some state or federal funding, that that's something that um, where there are pressures that will be put on, on the, the revenue coming from clients that may not be realistic. Uh, I also just wanted to touch on the tipped minimum wage, a lower tipped minimum wage also has a disproportionate impact on women in states that require employers to pay regular minimum wage before tips, so not so that don't have a lower tipped minimum wage. Poverty rates for women who work as tip workers are lower, wage gaps for those women are smaller, and overall wage gaps for women in those states are smaller. So that's a lot of facts and figures. Thanks for bearing with me on that. Any questions? Representative Black. Uh, we've been uh, learning about other states that have increased the minimum wage, and uh, Washington is one state we've seen some research. Um, and one of the concerns of the research is while it's increased the wage, it's decreased the working hours. It's increased retention of it. Have you seen those studies on the gender breakdown? Yeah. And is that, again, disproportionate for women, or? I have not seen yeah. those studies done uh, with a gender breakdown. I think that would be pretty interesting to look at, but I haven't seen that myself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And could you do this electronic version of this? Yes, you oh. have it, so yeah. you should, I mean, Ron has it. It's so. there, just yeah. you refresh the screen to see. I missed it? If you refresh it, stay there. Hmm? If you refresh it, stay there. Thank you. Who's that a tango? I think they were going to be child care bill that we passed a couple of weeks ago. Does that begin to address some of your concerns? I think it does begin to address it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, I do. Any other questions? Good. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> and we have Wes Hamilton, co-owner of Three Penny Tavern, and Matt Taco Pope. Oh. <laughs> Welcome, Wes. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. 
Yeah. Um, if you've never been here before, maybe we should introduce ourselves. Sure. Or what you listen. <laughs> I, 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 well, I have to <coughs> You don't want to go all the way back around, but I'm. We'll go back around. I'm, I'm Representative Trip Toriano from Standard. Uh, Tom Stevens from Waterbury. Uh, Matt Byron from Virgins. Know each other for twice now. Renee Zarr from Barnard. Don't be handy. Oh, that's a John Cash from South Burlington. Tommy Waltz from Mary City. Mary Howard from Rutland City. Great. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I lived for about four or five years in Walden, and I, I, I miss my time up there. Oh, yeah? You look for me. <laughs> yeah, I've been in standard for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my name is Wes Hamilton. I'm the uh, managing partner uh, for a number of restaurants, uh, Three Penny Tap Room here in Montpelier, Nat Taco. We have um, three locations at present. Uh, we're completely <coughs> going to expand. Uh, we also run a catering company that's um, <laughs> probably one of the busier catering companies in the state. Um, I think, uh, you know, generally, there's 50 to 60 people employed um, across all, all the companies, um, full-time or year-round. And then with the catering company, there's another dozen or two seasonal hires that we make. Um, and but I, I apologize. I had intend, intended to do some good, solid research and come with written testimony. And um, as you can imagine, I'm a little bit busy on top of um, uh, raising a, a, a nine-year-old, um, so I didn't write anything, um, but I, I more or less um, like to come in uh, and, and as a business owner say that I support raising the minimum wage, um, and I know when these kinds of things come up uh, and get considered, uh, the chamber likes to come in and various business associations and, 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 this, and groups uh, like to Make sure you know that uh, the sky will fall, and um, you know everybody will be unemployed, and we won't have any more nice things. And uh, it's just my perspective, uh, strongly, that that's not the case. Um, I think we, in all of our restaurants, work very, very hard to pay um, not only a minimum wage, uh, above minimum wage, but a, but a, a livable wage, and. Um, you know, I was just, in fact, this morning as I was like, oh God, I didn't write anything, what am I going to talk about? Um, <laughs> was thinking about that 13, whatever it is, minimum wage that we currently, or the livable wage um, that, that uh, you have um, studies that show. And um, I really greatly appreciate it that I'm here on the same day as the gentleman who was speaking about housing costs, because just really quickly in my head, I ran through, you know, I, I, I mean, I know at least in Montpelier, um, for example, good luck finding a place that's just a thousand dollars a month, and so really quickly, um, you know, fifteen dollars an hour isn't really getting you to that thirty percent of your your rental income. Um, and so I, I, I speak specifically to say that I'm I'm in favor of supporting minimum wage um, and having the minimum wage be a livable wage. Uh, I. I in theory, I'm here to support this bill. I think $15 an hour in five years is uh, pretty disappointing. And, and, and I support it in theory because it's better than what we have. I, I, I don't support the idea that we have to wait. Um, and one of my reasonings, um, because the first pushback that I normally get to hear is, um, well, you know, that's great. As a business owner, you can choose to pay higher wages. Um, and very certainly in the restaurant industry in particular, um, my experience is when our costs are out of line with our competition's costs, uh, we are then at a competitive disadvantage. And so I can pay everybody 15 to $20 an hour, um, and then you're going to see that reflected in the price of a beer or a burger or a taco. Um, and then you're probably going to choose to go around the corner to somebody else who's paying half of what I'm paying, and you can, you can get the, the, the beer or the burger for a lot less money. Um, and, and so that is why I feel very strongly that um, this, the State House um, is the place to ensure that everybody can live a dignified life, which you know, for me is what this really comes down to, um, uh, to be able to afford your bills, to, to not have to work 70 or 80 hours. 
um, in order to get by. I think that that is is our our our. Um, <laughs> I, I think we're just morally required as decent people, um, and and I know that there's I, they, they greatly appreciate that there's a lot of nuances that benefits Cliff. Um, you know, the, the I used to many years ago work in, in child care. Um, I know it's not a straightforward thing. I know it's a lot uh, for you all to consider, and there's there's complicating factors. Uh, I find uh, my just my pushback is it just if people are going to not be able to live a dignified life because that is how our system works, I, I think that's a bad system. Just um, our 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 duty as good neighbors and conscientious citizens to, to behave that way. Um, and when things happen, such as um, everybody, you know, the, that 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 floor does raise for everybody. Um, I think really exciting things can happen. Um, I testified more or less about this. Uh, my same line of, of reasoning for the paid sick days bill. Uh, once that passed, you know, we chose at our restaurants not to treat that as sick days. We said, you have this time off, we don't really care. What, we're not going to ask you for a doctor's note, you just have this time off. And we were able to use the requirements of the law for three days to then have that be the starting place and then offer, in fact, um, more time off for more senior staff. and. Um, And I greatly appreciate that we were able to do that, and we were able to, in part, do that because all of the competing uh, restaurants and businesses and bars around us were then living with that same cost of providing that benefit. And um, and I, I just I think wages are going to look the exact same way. Um, and uh, I, I, maybe that's all I have to say. <laughs> so. Um do most of your staff, the front of the house, um, uh, make enough with tips, recorded tips, to um, support a fifteen dollar minimum wage, or even what what it is now at a, a uh, ten seventy eight? So there's a little bit of difference is um, across the, the our different restaurants, um, but I, I believe yes, the answer is yes. Um, you know, I uh, very intentionally don't um, get involved with their tip reporting, uh, right. their right. business. Um, right. We do pay even our tip staff above the tip minimum. Okay. Um, we do not pay them, uh, you know, as far as their wage, the minimum wage. Um, okay. And what we've, what we've really found with that is um, they do well enough with tips to make mm -hmm. a livable, um, and to make a livable wage and um, there is, I don't know if you've noticed, a tremendous growth of, of restaurants and service industry. Um, certainly here in central Vermont, I think it's same is true in Jinnian County, maybe all over the state. Um, and then that has made um, kitchen staff, particularly, uh, and, and skilled kitchen staff, a more, more trying hire. Um, and one of our strategies there is to offer um, the best wages we possibly can, and um, you know, unfortunately, just kind of with how the industry standardly <clears throat> operates, um, that that puts us at leaning on on front of house staff to, to make their money in tips, yeah. more, more so. Yeah. Um, I think just about you know, uh, tip staff aside, uh, you know, in the kitchens. Um, the vast majority of our staff is making uh, $15 or more, and where we see that exception, um, you know, is usually in uh, dishwashers. Um, and I think, you know, similarly to the gentleman from the NEA, uh, like a school can't operate without the, the cafeteria staff. Uh, you know, a restaurant doesn't really work that well without dishwashers. Um, and those people as well should not have to then have a second job where they're working full time as well, and you know, very unfortunately, um, no stranger to dishwashing staff who, who comes on to shift after working some other job, or um, you know, vice versa. You know, you can't. I know I can't work Saturdays because that's when I'm working over here. Um, and, and as I said, we do our very, very best to 
not put our, our employees in that, that position, um, there's limitations on that because I can only, um, uh, you know, there's only so much I can do when I'm competing against somebody else who can charge three or four or five dollars less for, for a burrito than, than, than I do. Um, interestingly enough, um, our, for our, our catering business, which is primarily in the summer, um, a huge portion of, of the staff that we bring in for that are, are teachers and work in the school system, uh, work in home health care. Um, just uh, you know, to speak a little bit to some of the issues that, that the previous gentleman was talking about. And yeah, uh, Randall. So the, um, we've had witnesses who've come in here um, and they've, they presented a case, I guess, the, the fair way to say this, they presented a case that if, uh, if a worker has a gap in their earnings, that, that the worker has responsibility to either work harder or to increase their skills and become more competitive in the employment marketplace. And so I'm curious as a business owner, um, if businesses have that same responsibility, because we've had a lot of representatives of business organizations and businesses come in and say how difficult it would be for them. And I haven't heard as much of a responsibility assigned to them, you know, that says, well, then you maybe should make a more competitive business. You should work a little harder. You should, uh, you should diversify your business and build your skills. The solution seems to always kind of go back to the, it's the worker's problem to take on another job or to do X, Y, or Z. So I'm just curious as a business owner, you know, what would your message be to a business who says like, well, we can't, we can't afford this? Uh, I mean, I, I think um, my or anybody else's right to own a business uh, is gotta be secondary to any of our neighbors' right to survive and live a dignified life. And I end up this, uh, race to the bottom competition of, you know, this person is is uh, not getting by because they're not working hard enough or this, that, and the other thing. I mean, I think that that, I just, that just doesn't make sense to me. I think I think it's a, a statewide, it's our, our job as, as community members and, and uh, you know, maybe in this room we are, tend to be the, the more successful, uh, more comfortable members of our community. Um, I, th I think uh, if, if our focus isn't ensuring the quality of life for people who are, are in the socioeconomic ladder below us, um, then I, I, don't, I just don't know what our job is. I mean, I guess the, the, the inverse there becomes, you know, my job then becomes to just make as much for myself and, you know, too bad for those who can't get by. And I just, uh, I can't personally justify that kind of global outlook. I mean, I, I don't know if that really answers your question because to me it's, um, I, yeah, I just don't. I don't worship I, as a business owner, and frankly, as a successful business owner, I, I, I don't. I don't think business is the all and all. I don't really think that that's why we're here. I don't think. Um, I think it's a means to an end. Uh, Representative Stevens. I appreciate your more holistic of approach to um, this issue and, and having heard about the housing portion of it. How does that affect you? When we talk about expense to business, um, if you can't find people who are local, um, what does that, I mean, how does that figure in as an expense to you if, if, if I have to drive 25 miles to wash your dishes, um, for instance, um, do, do you find that your staff has to live farther and farther away from where your restaurants are? I mean, you're... I haven't, pardon me, um, haven't really seen that so much. Um, one of our experiences in paying generally better wages, livable wages, is um, our, our staff retention is, is, is pretty fantastic. And so we're, we, we don't find ourselves hiring very often. Um, perhaps tellingly, where we have the highest turnover by far is, is dishwashing staff. And um, 
there is got to be no shortage of times when a dishwasher is a no call, no show, um, and very often um, they'll come back the next day or whenever they're supposed to work next and say, oh, God, you know, I, I missed the bus, I'm sorry, you know, I mean, it's very, the issues of living um, below the poverty line are the reasons more often than not that they didn't show up to work. Um, but otherwise, you know, short we did, retaining staff um, when they're making livable wages has not been an issue. Um, but, but where we have seen turnover is, is where we, we've fallen short on paying livable wage. <coughs> there was a representative fire on this question. Um, so we've known each other for a long time. We're both restaurant industry people, and we've probably been having these conversations together for years and years now. So I, I've, I've actually applied a lot of the same philosophies that you have for employee retention. We've converted our, you know, the what's the state mandated sick time policy to five days. We've converted that to CTO, just like you did that a long time ago. Um, and also, you know, paying well above the arc for not only what the state minimum wage is, but also for whatever our, our given labor shared labor market is. And I've seen great retention as well out of all of that. Um, but by doing that, it's also you're, you're paying a premium above what the standard is for your localized area, right? So how do you see that impacting your need or possible need to escalate prices, you know, pushing up the cost of doing business as the whole sort of system moves up? Um, and like sort of a reflection, you know, people are talking about buying power being increased with greater wage capacity. I guess I'm asking that too. Um, with that, with that vein, so like, do you see the the dishwasher or the thirteen or fourteen dollar an hour light book going out to more like hyper localized, more expensive restaurants, or buying a twenty dollar pair of jar and tub socks, as opposed to maybe more shopping more frequently at a Walmart or shopping more eating more frequently at an Apple Foods? Yeah, I mean, you know I, what I'm saying. I, and well, I, I think I do, um, which I guess isn't something I touched on, but. Uh, is certainly something that I, I believe, and I think that there's good data to prove, and, and somebody mentioned before, um, about what lower wage people do, which is spending money locally, and I think that that... Um, you know, I get the point where the thing is like, what I'm saying is like, they're shop they might be shopping locally, but they're shopping locally, you know, it's not staying locally, right? It's gonna get siphoned out of the store. Right. Where going to a restaurant more like, uh, you know, a local eatery that has a local focus has a higher price point, right? So, sure, they're going to keep the money circulating momentarily in a hybrid local economy, but it's not going to stay there because it's going to go out because they're buying, they might be buying more clothes at Walmart, but they're not going to be dropping 20 bucks on the pair of Yeah, so I guess, I, what's the question? I don't understand. No, 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 just sort of like as you were talking about that, though, with that philosophy, do you see that, like, with, with what we're talking about, that application, like, do you, do you I, I mean, that, do you see that money really staying in the local economy? I guess was my first question. Yeah, I mean, I do. Um, I, I think um, if the uh, clerk at the local bookstore um, or one of my dishwashers has more money in their pocket, um, they're more likely to go out to the local stores and go go shopping. Um, I mean, I think one of those, you know, that notion that you just said of, of um, you know, if somebody goes to McDonald's or Walmart or wherever, and how that, that money doesn't actually stay very local. Well, uh, in part, that's because we're subsidizing those those employers. Uh, we're making plenty of money. Oh, sure. Uh, and, and so if, if, if rather than, hey, Wes, it's your responsibility to raise wages if you feel morally inclined to do that, <laughs> um, if everybody's <laughs> wages are raised, then, um, you know, that is money in the pocket of, of People who are working with those national chains, and, you know, I, I think I think it stays locally when we attack it on the state wide wide level. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. No, I got what you're saying. But then you also just said everybody's wages get raised, but not everybody's wages get raised. You know, if you, we if you see that like bottom tier going up, and even aside from the wage compression that we experience in a business like ours, where we're having that conversation of people between the like ten seventy eight and seventeen dollar an hour. So take a, like I'm saying, take a look at the people outside of that that bubble, 
and you already have a, a struggling middle, 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 excuse me, middle class, that will see cost of goods and services go up. Not even in theory, I mean, pretty much it's what is going to happen in tight margin industries. And like fixed income seniors, like do you see there being a potential impact on buying power to the middle class? I mean, those I, I, would, I, would, I mean, I guess I would assume so, but yeah. I, I mean, I, it, it, I'm, I'm sure either people have spoken or will speak who are economists who have, are paid for their day job to study the impacts of wages. I mean, I think you probably have seen, I know I've seen the, um, the studies that show, you know, what the success that has happened in the states and the cities who raised their minimum wage. <laughs> I, I think those studies make sense and they, they kind of confirm my, my gut instinct and my, where I feel more impetus, which is um, that we raising the bottom, raising the floor for everybody, getting everybody to where the floor <laughs> is still a reasonable existence. Uh, I, I just instinctually believe that that makes sense and it works. And so exactly how that affects the spending power of the middle class or anything else, I, just, I, I, I can't necessarily speak to that other than, um, like I said earlier, it just seems to be the right thing to do to take care of, to put money in the pocket of the people at the bottom. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how that plays out, I mean, right, there's all these things, the benefits clip, there's all this, you know, a million different things that happen once you do that. And that is complicated, and that will take a lot of really thoughtful, careful work. And I appreciate that you're all doing that work, uh, but I, I can't necessarily speak to all that. That's fair. Where's that tango? I often find myself sitting here thinking, envying people who live in communities that something like this is even possible to talk about. Um, if you were to come to northern Vermont, to a community like Enosburg or Richburg, um, we don't really have, well, take Enosburg out of that equation, Richburg, we don't really have any businesses. We don't really have any places for people to work. We don't really have places for people to spend their money. So the thought of raising the minimum wage makes me wonder why. For my constituents, I mean, there are people that if they are working in a convenience store and they're gonna get minimum wage, they're probably going to drive a half an hour and spend money at Walmart because we don't have any medical businesses. So I really, I do admire what you're doing and I'm really envious of the people who live in central Vermont and Chittenden County because I think you have some great opportunities here. And keep up what you're doing. Anyone else? Any other questions? Thank you. Done. Wes, thank you. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. So the bill I'm here to talk about very briefly with you is H394, which is the disposition of veterans' remains. Uh, so the Senate saw the bill and they thought that this committee did fantastic work. Uh, the only thing that they wanted to change is they wanted it to take effect sooner. So they changed the effective date from July 1st to on passage. Uh, and that is it. Really? Wow. Impressive. And so um, this is on our this is on the calendar for the day. That's right. It's it's up for action today. And so if we approve of this change, which I'm assuming we will. Um, we don't need to hold the bill. We don't need to bring the bill back unless for some other reason that I would preempt anybody by saying that would be bizarre and strange. Um, <laughs> but um, so if we vote on this bill then and, and support it, so when it comes up on the floor of the House, you may not be the right person to ask, but I'm assuming that, that when it comes up in the House that there will be a quick report and then there's a vote. I think that that's how it would go. Um, but again, I'd always defer questions to the clerk. Yeah. And this is coming back to us from Senate Government Ops. I know we just talked about that. Yeah, it's coming back from Senate Government Ops. Okay. Uh, so they they heard from 
uh, most of the same witnesses you did, okay. um, similar testimony, and strong support all the way around. Okay. Uh, so, like Do I you said, have a vote, the, John? I think it was five nothing. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think there was universal support there. And it was uh, thirty zero on the floor. Yes, I think that this passed the floor unanimously as well. So or unanimously, I think. Yeah, I can't you know, remember. It was thirty, right? I can't remember what the exact count was. Uh, I can get that to you, though, before the floor. Yep. There was a voice vote. Oh, have you got the uh, journal up? No, I, I track all these things. So. OK, so. Third reading was a voice vote, was it? Yeah. I don't know if it's unanimous. Yeah, second reading may have had a roll call, but. Um, no, that was a voice no, vote. That was a voice vote, too. too. Great. Yeah. So there you go. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. There's broad support. And this will be your pleasure. first bill to the governor. Yeah. Second. 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 Oh, yeah. you got another one, that one? No, he went. Oh, not no. us, but uh, he's three. He said, yeah, he's on the. Uh, oh, no, I meant the first bill from this yeah. body to the governor. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I hope I get notice of either. Yes, you usually if they If they do a public signing of it. Yeah. Right. Okay. You'll, you'll get an invite, certainly. We'll probably get it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, committee, what's your pleasure? Um, Sounds great. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. The motion will be the motion will be that we concur with the Senate proposal of amendment. So moved. Second. Any further conversations? <laughs> First, may commence to call the roll. Representative Wallace? Yes. Representative Long? Yes. Here. Um, representative Ganache? Yes. Representative Triano? Yes. Representative Howard Votes? Yes. Representative Kawaki? Yes. <coughs> representative Sack? Yes. Representative Byron? Yes. Representative Hango? Yes. Representative Stevens? Nine, zero, two. Okay. And, um, wait for Lee, yeah, let's keep that open for a minute. And, okay. Um, would you email? Um, I can text Emily. It would be, would you text Emily to tell her that we're about to take up um, Indigenous and then we need her vote on 394? All right, thank you, Danny. Right. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank Me you. Do. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, um, we are going to move on to H68. Um, before we talk about the full bill or, or entertain a vote on the full bill, uh, Representative Gamash had a had a um, an amendment that she wanted to present for the bill. Yes. And so, Michael, can you join us and yeah. walk us through what those changes to the bill are? Good morning, Mr. Chair. Michael Shernick, Legislative Council. Uh, before I do that, if I may, for just a moment, answer a question of Representative Kilkakis that's pertinent to all of you, and that was my comments yesterday versus legal holidays versus observed holidays, and I was thinking again about that section in Title Eight. and as I thought it through, Representative Gamache's amendment aside for just a moment, the main bill itself, the Title Eight provision, should stay as it is because the second Monday of October, regardless of whether it's ultimately called Indigenous Peoples Day or Columbus Day, is still a federal bank holiday and the business days correspond with both the federal state holidays and the uh, state holidays. And it would still be a legal holiday in Vermont because legal holidays are broader than just the days that state employees have off. If you ended up with Representative Gamache's amendment, and this is my intro into that, then you would probably would want to take another look at the t at, well, at both provisions because the uh, Columbus Day would stay Columbus Day 
and we'd have to slightly change the way the, ti the Title VIII provision is, and for that matter, the Title IX provision. And the additional day in February, as Representative Gamarsh is proposing, would not go into Title VIII because it wouldn't be a business day holiday, the way the second Monday in October is going to be regardless of what it's called. With that being said, well, I, I'm sorry, yeah. I, 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 I'm still having trouble. So in the, before we get to yeah. Mary Allen's, in, in the Senate bill, there's two times that all of these legal holidays are listed, um, page two of that bill, and then they're listed again on page four of the bill. Correct. And so those are legal holidays. And they'd still be legal okay. holidays. But what, when you talk about observed holidays, all of these in this current bill are legal holidays. Correct. Aside from Representative Camacho's right. amendment for the sake of our conversation. Right. Right. So, so observed holidays are, other, are not in this bill right now. Correct. In the Senate bill. In the those Senate are bill. other things that are named. It's Arbor Day, POWMIA Day, uh, okay. Juneteenth. But I'm not clear that these are all legal holidays. Right, but they're not, right. But the point that I was making and have been making and has and have been making through the, the winter into the spring is that a legal holiday is not necessarily a state employee's day yes. off. Okay, I, that's where I got. I got and that's where I've been I'm trying. Good. But the observed days are still another category, as I, I mentioned, the opera days, etc. Right. Okay. With that being said, I'm now. Mr. Chair, going to proceed, Representative Gamache's amendment. Thank you for your patience. Right, do we have it? Well, yes. You should have it on the electronic screen. You might have to it's read and refresh it. Do you have out of control of the electronic? Yes, the yes. Yeah. It's there. Um, oh, there. Okay, it just came up. Okay, yeah. thank you. And I am going to do this, if I may, one by one. The findings. The first find, uh, here we go. The first finding, and I'm comparing this against the Senate bill. The first finding is exactly the same. Uh, Indigenous Peoples Day was originally proposed in 1977 okay. by a delegation of Native American, I'm looking at both places, uh, by a delegation of Native nations to the International Conference on Discrimination uh, Against Indigenous Populations in the Americas. Same, no change. Number two is different. Uh, starting from number two, we have a different set of findings. The General Assembly recognizes and values the historic, cultural, and contemporary significance of the indigenous peoples of their lands that later became known as the Americas, which include Vermont. Then Vermont was, then there's a new number three. Number, actually number two for Representative Gamache for, is the same as number three in S-68. Number three for Representative Gamache uh, is the same as number four in S-68. Vermont was founded, yeah, Vermont was founded and built upon lands whose original inhabitants were the Abenaki people and honors them uh, and their ancestors, verbatim down to the, uh, down to the last word. Number five in Representative, uh, excuse me, number five Four in Representative Gamache's amendment matches number five in the bill. The establishment of this holiday, and I'm being careful to make sure that they're verbatim, the establishment of this holiday will, in the cultural development of Vermont's recognized tribes, uh, the establishment of will aid in the, excuse me, will aid in the cultural development of Vermont's recognized tribes while enabling all indigenous peoples in Vermont and elsewhere to move forward and formulate positive outcomes from the history of colonization. That's the same. Number five, number five is in Representative Gamache's is new. An Indigenous Peoples Day would provide a special opportunity for elementary and secondary school students to focus on the history of the Abenaki people in Vermont and to engage in frank discussions about the inter interactions of the early European explorers and settlers in North America, including Christopher Columbus, with the indigenous population. So again, number two from S68 <coughs> is now gone. All the other ones are here, minus the number two, and number five, Representative Gamache is new. And what was number two in the original one? Number two in the original one, Ray, which you do not have on your video screen right now, 
Many cities and towns in the United States have recognized Columbus Day as Indigenous Peoples Day to highlight, celebrate, and educate others about Indigenous heritage and uh, resiliency. And given the fact that Representative Gamache's amendment would have a different day, that becomes an irrelevant uh, finding. So we now look here. And at section two for Representative Gamache, uh, the numbering is a little bit different than the original bill, but Indigenous Peoples Day would be the first Monday in February. And why is that? Why and is that, that is because that's what Representative Gamache requested, and that's for her to explain. OK. Can I at this point? Uh, let's, let, uh, let's let Michael walk through it okay. and then come back. It creates that the first, as that's a new number three. Uh, Columbus Day stays the same as the second Monday in October. And also differently from the other bill, because this day is not, this is where you have a difference. I did not put this in the Title Eight section. I simply recodified Title Eight the way S68 recodifies Title Eight. Uh, excuse me, the way the Technical Corrections Bill recodifies uh, Title Eight for for wording and technical purposes, because this holiday would not be a, a banking business a banking business day off. It's not a federal holiday. It's just going to be, in this case, though, it's on the observed list. It's going to be closer to what an observed day is. It's on the legal list, but it'll be. Cl but for purposes of Title Eight, it would be. Okay. On this, on this though, on page two, it says it's a legal holiday. Correct. We're giving it the status of a legal holiday, but we're not giving it as a. A bet, and the number one, of course, that does that means that does not mean again it would be a state employee's day off. Be really clear about that. And number two is I didn't put it into Title Eight because it's not a, a banking day, business day, not counting for banking business purposes because it's not uh, it's not in the same. I didn't put it in because Columbus Day has been the, the 12th of October has been the banking business day off. I mean, the second Monday in October, I'm sorry. And that would remain the same. So this effectively is an observed day being given listing status as a legal holiday. It's blurring the lines a little bit, but that's what I did. Because, because none of the other observed days are legal holidays. But, but I wasn't, all, none of the other observed days were listed in Title VIII. But, and they're not legal holidays. But I gave it legal, at least for this draft, I gave it legal holiday status in Title I. I did not list it, and I could certainly do so if it, this amendment were to pass. I didn't list it in Title VIII because the 12th of October, the second I'm sorry, I'm dating myself. The second Monday in October, the second Monday in October would still be a legal a, 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 right. Which not only would still be Columbus Day, but it would be a closed ban, a business banking day. And I didn't add that to the list. I certainly could have done so but I didn't. And if that were the decision of the committee, I could certainly go back, should this amendment pass, I could add it the same way Bennington Battle Day, for example, uh, is listed here now, and Town Meeting Day is listed here now. It would be easy enough for me to change that should you decide to proceed with the amendment, to keep it parallel. Representative Howard. Um, <clears throat> is Columbus Day the way it is now celebrated? Is that a flex day for state No, it's, as I explained yesterday, no, no, Columbus no. Day is an irrelevant day in terms of state employees. Back uh, around 2001, 2002, uh, when Kathy Hoyt was Secretary of Administration, very late in former Governor Dean's administration, there was an agreement reached between the VSCA leadership of the time and the governor's office, which basically meant Governor Dean and Kathy Hoyt, that the flex status of Columbus Day would disappear. And in exchange for giving up that flex day, uh, Martin Luther King Day would become a full-fledged state holiday when all state employees, other than obviously emergency uh, public safety officials, would have the day off. Thank you. So yes, as I said, I could add in, if you decide to so proceed, that into the Title VIII list. Maureen, did you want to? Yeah, I wanted to explain how I came to February as designating that day. February is, um, the month of February is an observance of Black History Month, and at the same time it's also uh, American History Month. And I thought, 
inserting in, uh, inserting the Indigenous Peoples Day in that same time frame um, because it would not be an observed holiday in the sense of schools being closed or anything like that. It would it fits right in with history because it's part of history. Um, and so it would be an opportunity within that month, because you also do have observance <coughs> of Columbus Day, that it, it, it's a natural fit, and it would certainly lay the foundation for uh, um, uh, an in-depth historical learning of uh, the negative history that has been ascribed to Columbus, which I, through my schooling years, I did not learn. So I think if there's documented, where there is documented evidence of Columbus's actions within his uh, first coming to these lands that we know as the Americas, um, that should be part of, that should be part of the history as well. Um, because I, you know, truthfully have not looked at a curriculum uh, over the past years of what is taught about Columbus. So I was only taught the good things. So there are not such good things I have been apprised of. So um, I think it's good to cover all of that, but do it in an integrated way. And so for me, that makes the most sense to pick that particular month because it it incorporates expands on the history of Columbus, which is part of our American history, and it also because it's an observance of Indigenous peoples, um, it also touches on uh, minority groups in this country as well. So it could be a really integrative approach in curriculum. And, um, and it would be preserving the recognition of Columbus's accomplishments um, as well as adding to it the um, not so great things that his conquering of the land resulted in. So I, I'm really hoping that this, this is a, a balance. I was looking for a balance. Um, because Columbus Day is a federal holiday. It's still recognized on the federal level. So it's, it's preserving and expanding, <coughs> but it's also expanding in, in what I would hope would be a very educational way. And so that's why I brought this, had this amendment brought forward. Then I hope you will consider it. Um, and and hopefully it will pass. I mean, thoughts. Yeah, thoughts. Thoughts are welcome. Representative Pango. I was um, when we first took this up. I was sort of advocating changing the name of Columbus Day to something more inclusive um, so and I was told we really didn't have time to do that and that was a whole different ball game but I, I'm kind of interested in this um, I I hadn't seen this before so um, just looking at it I think it um, would help more accurately represent what's happened in history and um, hopefully give people more of a chance to be better educated about what's really happened before we actually erase the entire um, experience of Columbus. So I guess I'm wondering how it would work that schools would actually take up 
um, the issue of uh, in elementary schools um, at, to focus on um, history of uh, the native people um, and um, some of the uh, not so great things about Columbus. Do we do we have any idea how that might work in the schools, Mariana? The only way that I could that I would know of would be through curriculum development. I mean, we as far as I know, at least I would like to think that we still. Um, teach our students about the presidents and the different historical figures, good or bad, um, or I should say good and bad. Um, and so to me this is just an, it would be an expansion of the curriculum in such a way as to integrate all of this. Right. So that it could be taken, taken up, not as um, individual um, subjects, but more as like a three-pronged approach, let's say, to to that whole um, the whole issue. Yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, so so that's that's my intent. Right. And, I and, that, yeah. and I think I think that it's a fair way of being able to bring forth um, additional history and. Um, and, and I am concerned, we have been, over the past few years, there's been a trend uh, nationwide to um, displace uh, history, figures in history, uh, to literally tear them down because we don't like what they represent or things they have done. And I think that that is a very, I, I don't agree with that. I think our history is our history, whether we like our history or, or aspects of it or we don't. It's still part of who we are. And, and it needs to be, it do, it, it, it's not good, it's not good for any nation to wipe out or try to diminish any part of its history. Because that's how history repeats itself. You know, we, we need to look at our history and the things that we think were um, we wouldn't want to repeat. Um, that should be still in the forefront so that we learn about it and we learn and discuss why it was negative or why it was wrong. Yeah. You know, everything has a context. Yep. Uh, things that are done in, in one part of development of a country's uh, history is is different. The, 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 the values change, the norms change. You know, things just change. Nothing remains yep. the same. And so part of my distress about what's happening to our nation's history is that things are not looked in context of what of what was happening in the country at that particular time. Which is not to say that we should approve and say, oh well, yeah, that was a good thing. No, it's more of if you can understand the context, then you can understand why it happened. And that's, that's the lesson of the why. So that it will not be, though we can do our best to not allow it to be uh, reproduced in some other part in history. I mean, that's, that's how you come to, the more you understand, the greater the potential you have to um, reduce, certainly, things like racism and, 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 and all those. We have to learn from our history. Well, I, you know, idealistically, I totally agree. I mean, I think that that's, but it is, I think, idealistic. I think that History does repeat itself, and we find that in war and in racism and Well, white human nature is what human nature is, unfortunately. Sure, sure. Yeah, sure. I understand. So I, I don't disagree. I think idealistically that was certainly always my hope. That but we, we can only get there we can learn that. through education. Well, my question then is how does this translate into um, making sure that this is taken up in classrooms around the state on this particular day. That's my question. Whether or not we this this amendment will get that done through curriculum. You have right, but there is no provision for curriculum in this amendment. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm 
Uh, yeah. Representative Wallace and Hanko. Well, uh, I'm going to sound like I'm arguing in two different directions okay. at once. We have a model for this. And an abundant was the King Day. Before it became a legal holiday, schools were using that as a time to look at the yeah. 60s. They, you know, yeah. they would play the I Have a Dream speech and, and just get into this whole civil rights movement. So I think that all that there is a lot for doing that kind of yeah. thing. It's up to the schools Good. to do it. Point. On the other hand, I don't like moving it to February. <laughs> I would rather we keep the day on October 12th because. What is key here is this sudden impact of the Europeans showing up in a brand new continent and in some respects pretending there was nobody there or taking advantage. They certainly were aware there were people there, but in history we kind of heard like we didn't hear what the indigenous people's impact were in all of this. And we didn't hear that the Europeans brought smallpox and measles and, you know, the, there was a massive die-off of all the indigenous peoples here. And then some were enslaved. We didn't hear all that. And so I think it's very important we, we still tie it to that. Here's the arrival of the Europeans. And bam, what an enormous impact that had on both Europe and the Americas. And of course, where we are now. And so I would argue for keeping it in October. So I would say, in answer to your comment, that Independence Day is July 4th. We teach our children, though, about Independence Day and Declaration of Independence during the school year and not on July 4th. Well, school so, so, session in July 4th. I, well, I, I, I understand <laughs> that, but I mean, in, I think not. So Columbus Day is a federal day. So it, it kind of has to stay where it is, if it's unstable, <coughs> at least I think. I don't, I mean, I guess it could a be state, no, just A state is under no obligation to observe a federal holiday as a state holiday. That's the decision of the state, completely the decision of the state. Mm -hmm. Largely they do correspond, but there isn't any statutory mandate that the states have to observe federal holidays. So, yes, Representative Clackman, just following up oh. on that. Oh, oh, oh. oh, sorry, did you just got that? I'll start right. Thank you. Um, I was going to say a little bit more about Representative Walsh's first statement because you pretty much spoke for me when you said that we have a model for this. And incorporating, I didn't think about putting it in a different month. But if we're going to put it in any month, that's a good month to put it in because it is a history month. Um, and I absolutely have seen in the school system how um, by designating a holiday or a month or calling, some, making a proclamation even, that, excuse me, that the schools take up this, this um, subject and use it to their benefit because education today isn't about learning out of books. It's about <coughs> practical education. So a student is going to say, why do we have this day? So that will evolve into a whole project for that student to research why we have this day and the pros and cons of it. Because that's what proficiency-based learning is all about. That's what um, personal learning plans are all about. So I think this would be a great opportunity for students to learn about this. Um, but that's all I'm going to say about it. John? Uh, well, it is a federal holiday. Hawaii doesn't uh, have it at all. It has its own founders uh, day, I think it's called. And then Alaska never had it. But in uh, two years ago, Alaska did create an Indigenous Peoples Day on Columbus Day. But it never recognized Columbus Day as a federal holiday. And then, as you know, our state, both Shumlin and now twice, our Governor Scott has some proclamations or being called Indigenous People Day on Columbus Day. So we have that tradition. Other states, Oregon, Minnesota, Iowa, North Carolina, are, have done the same. Uh, last week, New Mexico's legislature, when the governor signed it, changed Columbus Day to be called Indigenous People's Day. So there is a movement. It's in the, it's in the, let's see, it's in the legislatures of Maine, New Hampshire, Kansas. They're all looking at it right now as well. So I, I think 
there is now. Um, and uh, uh, there's a movement to really, uh, really investigate this. And, and I don't think it's, it's erasing history. I think it's completing history in, in this change. So I. I see. Uh, but I, when you when you replace one thing for another, you are removing it. And and you know, uh, it's a trend. You're right. It, and to me, I don't see that as a good trend. Because I don't think replacing one thing for another is the is the route to go. I think expanding uh, on what is and in, in broadening and incorporating more because because you're not see if you if you replace one thing for another you, you minimize what you are re, not you don't minimize what you are re, the replacement you are minimizing what what you are replacing. And so if the object is to bring things forward um, and to have a more in-depth um, dispersing and looking into and doing a deep dig, I think it lends itself more if you retain But, but in the way you and I learned Columbus Day, as, as you said a little earlier, the Native American story was erased from that. We Which was heard. not right. Which is why we are doing indi one of the reasons that we are doing Indigenous Peoples Day. We're righting a wrong, and so right. I don't want to right a wrong at the expense of creating what I perceive as another wrong. Well, so. I think that's we're, I think we're agreeing with part of it, but I think it's rightfully placed on Columbus Day to complete the history. Okay. Representative uh, Byron and Zaki. Um, so in this this conversation between the, the celebration of the dates and the discussion of erasing history, not erasing history, updating history, um, I mean, I made it no secret that I view this as a, as a necessary updating of history. But in updating history, I mean, I consider myself, when I was making the decision, career decision of my life when I was young, it was to be, go into the study of his, the academic study of history or food. I chose food, but I still consider myself <laughs> an, an, an amateur history nerd. Um, so in the conversation of, of, of erasing to replacing to updating, if we did move forward with the original bill, I don't see how we could teach anything about the indigenous population of this country without the conversation of Columbus. I mean, it'd be impossible. <clears throat> it's such a massive impact. It's such a major part of it that I don't see a possible way of accurately depicting history without the conversation of Columbus being a major part of it. That's why I'd say it's completing this, not erasing. Yeah. But the fact that, that, that saying that, it, that the, the Columbus narrative, the Columbus conversation would be removed from that conversation, I don't see how that could possibly take place from just the historical conversation. Representative Slot. So I'm not going to talk about the merits one way or the other of the idea. I guess. What I just want to express, and I'm new to this process and to this building, I, I, I'm expressing a little frustration because I feel like we've already had the discussion. And, and, I, and I don't know if this is customary of the process or not, but I feel like this is the second time, actually, that we've had a discussion that took us to a certain point, and then at the point at which we're going to vote, uh, we're sort of thrown back into having, like, relitigating a discussion that was already had. Not the specifics, but generally, we're sort of relitigating something that was already kind of moved on. And, and I'm just, so I'm very frustrated by that. Um, Representative Hanko? I'm going to share Representative Zott's frustration because when we first talked about this, I brought up um, doing something different than the original bill. And I was told that we didn't have time to do that, and we all moved on. So um, apparently there is time to discuss changing the original bill. And me being naive and new, I don't know these things. So I'm with you. I hear your frustration. And um, I guess we just need to move on and make our decision. 
Well, I'll speak to that just a little bit. I mean, it, you're both right. Um, we made a choice to, we were ready to pass out a bill and we chose to hold it because we, the Senate was voting on the same bill. And um, in consideration of, while the, same, while the bill was roughly the same, there were changes in it. <clears throat> and because we're taking up the Senate bill, um, just, from a, just from an overall thematic standpoint, um, once we start work on a Senate bill, we have a responsibility to at least hear out and relitigate to a degree on the, on the, um, on the bill itself, even though it is repetition. Um, we're not shoving this down people's throats in this committee or on the floor of the House. Um, we're, we're just reopening the conversation on this based on, uh, based on the changes that, that, that Legislative Council provided. And when an opportunity arose for an, for an amendment to be offered, um, Representative Gamash took it. That's her right. And so the question before us, um, I do want to vote on this bill today. Um, whether we vote on it before lunch or after lunch is, is up to us to a degree. Um, I'm leaning towards after lunch at this point, but maybe we'll get there in 15 minutes. Um, the, I, the question that I have for a process is that uh, we have before us, um, we have before us the Senate bill, which we have yet to vote on. Um, traditionally, we can make changes uh, as suggested by Rep Representative Gamash. It wouldn't be a vote. It, it would be a hand vote, basically. Um, and the reason for that is that we haven't, we're not, we wouldn't be amending an official bill, or we wouldn't, we wouldn't be amending our take on that official bill as if we voted it out and then the, the amendment came forward tomorrow. Um, so the first, so the process, for the process, we would take a hand vote. This would also um, allow Representative Gamash the opportunity to offer this on the floor if she so chose. At which point we would take a, um, and if she did, then we would take a voice vote on on that bill, um, on that amendment, because um, right now we would either be changing it of our own volition by consensus within the committee or by, uh, like I said, by a hand vote um, prior to voting it out. So that's the process in front of us. If we want to, I, I mean, I'm kind of willing to just sit with it till after lunch. Um, and try to fit it in, actually probably fit this in after. And I don't know what your, I don't know what your um, availability is after Mr. one. Mr. Chair, after, after I, this afternoon, I'm, told, I'm, I'm writing, as you can well imagine, but I don't have any other testifying obligations until tomorrow morning. So I am totally flexible right through the afternoon. So if we could, um, have you 15 minutes after the floor prior to our, we have a walkthrough um, on S83. Um, and at That's that, totally doable for me, Mr. Chair. Okay, if you could be available for that. Um, yes, Representative Gamash. So I just want to make a further comment regarding the amendment. This amendment was actually drawn up at the time we were having the original discussion before we learned that the Senate or we as a committee learned that the Senate was working on this. And um, I, I asked uh, Mr. Chernock to hold it until after there was further discussion, um, because it was in the same time frame that the Senate bill was then introduced. And I was not clear on what path uh, it was going to take and whether or not it was going to be whether or not there would be changes in the Senate bill, <clears throat> um, which could have made the amendment, uh, would, could have been a duplication in some ways. or So I was very unclear. So I just kind of held it until getting to the point of, mm -hmm. that we're at now. And that's why I didn't introduce it before now. 
So, so what I'm going to leave us with before lunch, as I said, is when we come back from lunch, if you want us to take a vote on your amendment on this, the Senate bill, which passed the Senate by voice vote unanimously and, and through your committee five zero, then, um, then I will have a voice vote or a show of hands to change the bill before we vote on it, come out of committee to get to the floor. Um, after that, after that hand vote, then we'll have, like I said, then we'll have a roll call on this. And if, but again, that if we take a, my my understanding of the rules is that if it's, and I may be wrong on this, but my understanding of the rules is that if you offer an amendment before the bill is passed, if we vote down your amendment, you won't be able to reoffer it. <coughs> well, if we take a roll vote, but. It, Oh, are you speaking on the floor, Mr. Chair? Or well, starting okay. here, but I'm just trying to let the opportunity it's provide. Be the purely technical question, if the committee votes it down, traditionally, a member has not offered the amendment subsequently on the floor as a matter of committee comedy. But that's not prohibited. That's a tradition, not a rule. OK. So there you have the ruling on it. So um, that's, I'm st uh, again, I still am going to hold to the hand vote after lunch, and then we'll take a roll call vote on the bill itself. Um, and, and if you want to offer this on the floor, and you know, then we would come back and take a roll call vote prior to you offering it so that we can then report on that, and and then you would have an opportunity to discuss this on the floor if, if you so choose. It's your right. So, um, so that's about as close as I can get to answering both of the concerns of, of Representative Angle and Zahn. So, um, so we'll break now. Thank you, Michael. And I will see you this time clear, not at a specific time, but approximately 15 minutes once the House adjourns this afternoon.